across our nation, schools celebrate Read Across America with guest speakers and fun activities. At Chesapeake High School in Pasadena, Maryland, we celebrated our 11th annual Day of Reading with authors, artists, astrophysicists, and even a former NFL football player. Sit back, relax, and enjoy our 2018 Read Across America event. Hi guys. So we have Alan Smell here to speak. And I have personally read one of his books. It's called Clash of Eagles. It is a trilogy. I took the journey. I loved it. I recommend that you guys read it. It's a little bit of a hard read, but I promise you, you're going to love it. Um, he's, his book is about the Romans, and he has done extensive research on both the Romans and the Native Americans in order to write this book, or trilogy. Um, again, I loved it. Really wish you guys would read it. It's here in the Media Center. So here we go. Dr. Alan Smell. Thank you very much, Anna. Hi, hi everybody. I have some slides and they'll be coming on in a moment. Uh, following on from the previous speaker, I'm going to talk about three passions that I have and that have sustained me through my life. Uh, two of which I've made money at and the third of which I definitely haven't. But they're all things that I, I've enjoyed very much and they're the things that keep me going. They're the things that that, that keep me up at night. There are the things that make my life worth living. And I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see these slides be, because of the light in here, but there's just a few visuals here to, to, to help us along. And so what I'm gonna be talking about is uh, space, time, and song, three very large topics. Uh, I'm Alan Smale. In my day job, I work at the, uh, at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in the Astrophysics Science Division. And so I'm gonna be talking a bit about astronomy to start with. Uh, obviously, I'm gonna be talking mostly about the books, about the Clash of Eagles series. And, and about the work I did on that, the research for those, and all of the thoughts that I had about those. And towards the end, I'm going to be talking a little bit about music. So, to begin with, here we are. So, I'm an astronomer. I work at the Goddard Space Flight Center. As you can tell, I'm not really from around here. I grew up in England. Uh, I grew up in Yorkshire, England. Uh, you can't see that, but that's uh, down there are my, my parents, down by that wall. Uh, I'm a, my official job title right now is that I'm the director of the High Energy Astrophysics Science Archive Center, which is a posh way of saying that it's a, a very large library for data from, from a certain type of, of, of object in our galaxy, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, I've loved astronomy all my life. I've loved stars and planets all my life. Uh, I grew up thrilled by the, the Apollo moon landings. Uh, you see a little astronaut down there. And I was always convinced that I would end up in space. So my passion as a very young kid was that I was going to become an astronaut. I was going to go up into space. I was going to walk on the moon. Maybe I'd even go to Mars. It didn't quite work out that way. I don't entirely blame myself for that, but you know, it's hard. So, uh, so I ended up in space in a way. I ended up working at the Goddard Space Flight Center, which is really cool. And so, uh, so I'm pretty happy. Can we have the next slide? The, other, the, <clears throat> the second thing that I'm, I'm uh, really here to talk about is the Clash of Eagles series, and that's out from Random House Delray. The series is now complete. There are three books, Clash of Eagles, Eagle in Exile, and Eagle and Empire. And I, I, I'm very excited to have these books out. Uh, I've been writing all my life. I've been writing since, I, since I've been reading, essentially. My parents can remember me writing when I was very young, even when I couldn't spell all the things I was supposed to be writing. Uh, the first professional story I got published uh, 20 plus years ago, and that was a fantasy short story in an original anthology. Uh, and I've had maybe 40, 40 shorter stories published since then in addition to the books. And all, all the stuff that I've written recently, uh, even though I'm a scientist by training and I've got a very scientific mind, uh, a lot of what I think about when I'm not doing science is historical. I've always been a history buff. I've always enjoyed reading about history. And I've got to tell you that my history lessons when I was at school were not very inspiring at all. It was all British history. It was all kings and queens and revolutions and that kind of stuff. It was all, it's all very, there were a lot of battles. There were a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of numbers, a lot of dates to learn. But, but the thing about history that I really enjoy, I don't know whether it's taught that way any longer, but the history that I really enjoy reading about is more social and economic. It's about how people lived. It's about what life was like back then. And so I've done a lot of reading over the years in, in that area. Okay, we can take the next one. Um, the third thing I do is sing, and this is the one that I don't make any money at at all. Uh, I've, been, I've been interested in astronomy and interested in writing all my life. Uh, I came to singing a little later on. I'm in a group called The Chromatics. It's a vocal band, it's an a cappella group, kind of like Pentatonix, except not as, not as rich and popular. 
Uh, so we've been in the, we're, there are six of us in the group and we've been doing that for over 20 years as well. And over that time we've done, we've recorded nine albums, we've done nearly 400 gigs. Uh, we have an educational <coughs> CD, in fact, the Astro Capella CD, which is all about, which is uh, astronomically correct, a cappella, it's a bunch of songs about the universe that we wrote, and that's in use in schools across the, across the country. Okay, next please. There's a lot of words on this slide, but basically what it says is that I was born in England. Uh, I, lived, I grew up in Leeds in Yorkshire. Uh, I, I went to Oxford and then I did a, a PhD there in astrophysics. And then I came to, the, the, then I did a postdoc at the, at the University College London. And then I came to the States. I came to the States in my late 20s. Uh, I was coming for three years. I knew I wouldn't want to stay here any longer than that. So I, so I came over here on a student visa, even though I was a postdoc at the time. I decided I wanted to come to the States, see what it was like. I've always been interested in travel as well. So I came over here for three years, and uh, I'm still here 30 years later. So I guess life doesn't always go the way you, you expect. But I'm very happy here, not planning to go anywhere else. And life is good. Next, please. One of the cool things about astronomy, uh, optical astronomy at least, is you get to go to amazing places. And so here are, here's a, here are three observatories that I went to when I was an optical astronomer. I started out doing, uh, looking at astro astronomy with, uh, with visible light, light that you can see. And so the South African Astronomical Observatory uh, is the top one. Down there, the, the, the legend is off the bottom there. But that's actually in the Canary Islands. That's a, an observatory run by the Brits in the Canary Islands. And then there's the Anglo-Australian Telescope. My very first observing run, I started in England and went down to South Africa and then across to Australia and then home. So that was, that was quite a big journey for my first trip as a graduate student. OK, uh, you probably know about the electromagnetic spectrum. The part that we use is, uh, in our everyday lives is this little part right here. That's the visible light. That's everything you see around you. I'm sure a lot of you know all this. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum itself is huge. And when we, look at, uh, when we look at stars, it's very important to look at them not only in the optical, but also at other energies. And so what I moved on to uh, was, was looking at uh, stars and, and uh, very powerful sources in the X-ray wavelength. And these are the same X-rays that the that people use in hospitals to look at your bones. We don't actually X-ray the stars, but we do look at the X-rays that come from stars. Next, please. And the type of object I look at. There are actually <coughs> hundreds of this type of object in the galaxy. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it. This is actually two stars rotating around each other. And so this is a, that one is a fairly normal star, a, a red star, say. And right in the middle of that accretion disk there, there's a neutron star or a black hole. It's extremely dense, extremely powerful object with a very high gravitational field. There's a lot of gravity there pulling in material. Material comes from that ordinary star, spirals around in a disk, and eventually goes uh, over the event horizon into the black hole <coughs> or onto the neutron star, this very dense thing. And that's where the X-rays come from. So there are extremely powerful X-rays that come from this object. So when we look, we look at this type of object in the X-ray and in the optical, we can put all that information together and we can learn quite a lot about the physics of the, of the stars, what's going on there, and a lot about actually really important physics as well as astronomy. Next. And so uh, then I got to work on, on a, my first satellite mission was a European satellite called Exosat. Next. And now I'm involved, particularly with my current job, with a, with a whole bunch of uh, satellites that are looking. One of the reasons we have to look above the atmosphere with, to look at X-rays is because they're absorbed by the atmosphere. And so a lot of the work we do with X-rays is actually, with detecting X-rays, we use satellites for that. So you can see five or six satellites there. NISA over there is actually a, an experiment on the space station that's just gone up, and that's really cool. Next. OK, so when I started writing, I was writing embarrassing tars and ripoffs. I think I've actually said most of this stuff here. The Clash of Eagles series came out in 2015, 2016, and 2017. Um, we can go on. These are the covers of the Asimovs. The Asimovs is, is one of the best science fiction magazines in the country. And so I'm kind of pleased to have been published. That was always one of my ambitions. My, my early ambitions was to get published in that magazine. And these are the books. The, the top of the rank, the top, top row that you see there is the Clash of Eagles series as it was published in the States. And below there, there are three completely different covers for exactly the same books. And th those are the covers. They're sold by Titan Books in the UK. 
And uh, people ask me which of the covers I like best. And in fact, I, I love all of my children equally. Uh, I think the, the top ones are really cool because you get really good images of, of who the characters are in the story. And you get a feel for, for, for what drives them. And uh, I think those are kind of interesting. But and beneath, there are a few little few battle scenes and things like that. And there's some almost Easter egg-y things in there once you read the books. Once you get like part way through the books, you'll understand what's going on on the covers. And I think that's kind of neat, too. Next. So, what are these books? I will tell you now. Uh, welcome the future, prepare for change. Yes, do that. But also welcome the past. Think, and think how we got to where we are now. From where we are now, there are many possible futures. And, for, and when we got, the, uh, the, we got here because there were, very, there were a large number of possibilities beforehand. So back in history, the history is not inevitable. There are many other different ways things could have gone. And it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, if a battle had gone differently, even if the weather had been different on a certain day, uh, if somebody had behaved in a different way, uh, may, maybe the history we know would have been very different. And so one thing that's very important is that the future is what you make it. But it's also fun just to think about the past and think about, uh, about, about why things worked out the way they did. Next. Clash of Eagles, alternate history. Who knows what alternate history is? Who already knows what alternate history is? OK, some do, some don't. Uh, the, uh, if you've seen on TV The Man in the High Castle or Timeless, those are se series that, uh, that, that play with this idea. But essentially, alternate history is uh, history that didn't happen. So you imagine what would have happened, like in my case, uh, if the Roman Empire had survived, had not uh, the Western Roman Empire had not collapsed in 476 AD. <coughs> but had actually gone on uh, and, and carried on being a, a, a force in the world for considerably longer than that. Uh, the TV series, The Man in the High Castle, uh, it's actually quite a, an idea that people have used a lot, is what would have happened if Hitler had won the Second World War. Uh, the Timeless series it goes into all kinds of variations of, uh, and possibilities of things. You can kind of see how things might go differently in the future because of changes we're, uh, that were made in the recent past. So essentially, alternate history is, a, is a, a story that was written where history went differently and things are happening differently in the world. And I'll come back to in, in, in a future slide to say why I think that's kind of important and uh, an interesting thing to do. But in these books, back please, in the Clash of Eagles books, uh, so the Western Roman Empire survived. It's 1218 AD and they're moving across North America. The Romans are moving into North America. And uh, they, they land at the Chesapeake Bay, they're coming west across, and they start to, they, they meet the Iroquois, and then later on, the Mississippian culture. When you think about Native Americans, you probably think about more modern representations of Native Americans. And in fact, in the several hundred years before the Native Americans that, that people met that came over from, the, from Europe, uh, they actually looked very different. And the Mississippian culture was actually a very powerful culture that was all across North America, but especially down the Mississippi River, River and down the Ohio River. And uh, as I say here, when, when my Romans meet my Native Americans, hijinks ensue. And what the, one of the important things to, what the, the, the important locations there <coughs> is Cahokia. Yes, next slide. Romans, a lot of people know what Romans look like. Here are a few stock images of Romans. So you can imagine these guys marching across into the wilds of North America back in the 13th century. And at the bottom, there are some Viking longships. The Vikings are really good with navies. The Vikings are what helped the Romans come across the, the Atlantic. They're the reason that the Romans can get into North America. Next. And so here is North America. North America without, without the large cities and highways that we know about. And so when you're traveling around North America back in those days, you're traveling around the river system. And so you can see here the, the rivers, you know, the Mississippi and this whole, the whole watersheds of rivers that go into the Mississippi, into the Ohio Valley. And so my characters spend a lot of time on rivers when they're trying to go long distances. Uh, the Mississippian culture was all over the, the kind of eastern side of North America from roughly the, the like 1050 through 1250 was the height of the civilization. And you can see these dots all over the North American map here. And these are various cities that, that were part of the Mississippian culture at that time. Uh, down there on the, on the right is, is my version of North America. Next, please. Uh, which looks like this. This is in the front of, of all of the books. This is North America, Clash of Eagles style. So now this is called Nova Hesperia. We're in North America as being kind of invaded by the Romans from the east, 
coming in from the Chesapeake Bay. There are the various tribes that they're meeting. And here is Cahokia. This, this part here, Cahokia, it's where St. Louis is now. Cahokia is a very real city. People, uh, there are maybe a third of people uh, think that I made Cahokia up. I, in fact, did not make Cahokia up. Has anybody been to Cahokia? Has anybody around here been to Cahokia? Okay, a few. <coughs> That's great. It's really worth, it's really an important place and worth going to see. Uh, Cahokia was the big city of the Mississippian culture. And yes, there were big cities on the North American continent before Europeans came over and made them. Uh, Cahokia, there were probably about 20,000 people in the city itself and many more in the surrounding villages. Um, it was a mound building culture. I'll show you some pictures of what the mounds probably look like. So it was quite an important thing. It was the, the, an important confluence of the river and it lasted for a couple of hundred years. Next slide. And here are representations of what we think it probably looked like. So you can see the, the big mound. There's a, there's a great mound there, which is now known as the Master Mound. There's a palisade all around the outside. There are some really quite sophisticated huts and houses uh, for the era all the way around there. There are neighborhoods. There are not exactly streets, but there are certainly thoroughfares. And you can see all of these various things. And you can see that these things are pretty huge as well. Uh, they, the, the main mound, uh, which you can still see, it subsided a little bit, but they built this. They built this themselves. They like, built, up, built it up out of clay. It's quite a big engineering achievement to do that. And so this thing is actually fairly huge. It covers like a thousand feet aside across the bottom, well, across the bottom, and it's a couple of hundred feet high. And that's pretty impressive for, for the 11th, 12th, 13th century culture in the middle of, the, in the middle of North America. So that's the setting for Clash of Eagles, and uh, <clears throat> the Romans think they're going to have an easy time when they come across the Cahokians, and that's not what happens at all. Next, please. Uh, these are representations of what we think Cahokians look like. So they may not be your stock mental images of Native Americans. Of course, there are very many different Native American tribes and cultures, and uh, uh, that they, they, they dress <coughs> differently, they look differently, they uh, uh, use scarification and face paint differently, they ate different foods. Some of the Native Americans who lived along rivers, for example, ate fish. And others thought fish was dirty and disgusting and they did not eat it. So uh, I had to do quite a lot of research. I thought these books were going to be easy in a way because I already knew a lot about Romans. I've grown up with Romans all my life. Uh, not really, literally. But so in, in, in England, there's a lot of Roman remains. And when I went on family vacations, I used to go up to Hadrian's Wall, which is this wall across like the top of the top of England, in between, roughly in between England and Scotland. And the Romans built that. It's like the Great Wall of China, except much smaller. And uh, the, the, that was built either to keep the Picts out, the Scots out, or the Romans in, or just provide a border crossing, we're not sure. But what, there's a lot of, there are a lot of forts and a lot of towns along there, a lot of Roman ruins. And so that was why I really got into Romans at the time. So I thought I knew a fair amount of Ro about Romans. I knew I would have to do a really a great deal of research into Native American cultures to do them justice. What I actually eventually found out was that I needed to know far more about Rome as well, about how they, how they made things. And so I ended up doing, doing like hundreds of books worth of research into, into both cultures. And I really enjoyed doing that. One of the problems with writing the kinds of things that I write is that I spend so much time reading, reading that I don't get as much writing done as I should. So, anyway, those are, those are some of the, uh, uh, those are a lot of the images that I used when I was writing the Cahokian. Uh, <clears throat> later in the books, there are down in the southwest of, of the United States, there's the, there's the Chaco Canyon area. And this, uh, this was like the, the Mayan culture that was just com coming, to, coming to the end of its, of its real, uh, the, the, the Anasazi, sorry, culture. And that was coming to the, to, to the end of its uh, time, really, at that time. But some of my characters do come across people of the ancient Pueblo cultures in what remains of, of Chaco Canyon. And this is also another example of a really kind of interestingly large size. It's not so much a city as it is an enormous building. And you can walk around it in this fascinating place, surrounded by cliffs and well worth reading about even if you can't get there. Next. So one of the cool things about writing the books was that I, I get to go to Comic Cons and, uh, and other science fiction conventions. So here's just a, a, a picture of that. So my book, Eagle and Empire, is hiding up there and with all of these other Del Rey books. So it was when I first went to my first Comic Con, I've now been to three, that I was actually convinced that, yes, I really was an author. Before then, I was having trouble believing it. San Diego? Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I started, I did New York Comic Con, and then I did San Diego Comic Con, and last year I did Phoenix. And I'm going to be doing Denver Comic Con in 
whenever that is, June. I'm going, they're going there in June. Comic cons are awesome. And that's me doing the cover reveal for the third book at San Diego Comic Con. Okay. Clash of Eagles, what does it do? Uh, so why is alternate history fascinating? Here's why I think it's fascinating. Uh, it enables us to put up a mirror to real history. What we're doing when we're looking at this version of North America, the one that came out of my brain, uh, is that we're, we're, we're looking at, so we're, we're looking at a, a type of North America that's very different from the Colombian invasion we know. It's very different from the Spanish and the, and the British and the, and the French. There, there were incursions by all of them, and they all came over, and they all tried to colonize or trade or conquer. They, they all had very different approaches in, in what they were trying to do in North America. And so one of the things I really wanted to do, I kind of got interested in this story idea around about the time of the bicentennial, was try and look at it in a different way and see how things might have gone very differently with a different type of invading force. And so that's why I brought the Romans and the Norse in there. And one thing uh, alternate history gives you is interesting historical resonances as well. Because hopefully people know the real history and they know the history that you are writing, the, the, the different history that you're overlaying. And you can kind of pick up kind of cool sort of resonances and, uh, uh, and traces going backwards and forwards there. So, and I also obviously enjoyed writing about the Mississippian people. As soon as I learned about Cahokia, I knew that it was something that I really wanted to write about. And all the intellectual stuff aside, what it mainly is is an action adventure story. And so uh, I really enjoyed taking my hero, Gaius Marcellinus, uh, across North America. I enjoyed having his having his, uh, the way his mind works changed by what he sees around him. <coughs> he starts off as a very military guy. He understands the Roman army. That's pretty much all he understands. And obviously when he comes over to North America, he finds out that, uh, that, that things, things are very different from how, from how he imagined them. And he learns a lot about uh, culture and community. And so even though he's a pretty experienced guy, he, he, he learns to think in new ways. Next, please. Sometimes people ask me about how, how long it takes to get a book published, and I'm not going to read all of this in general, but it actually takes quite a long time. Uh, the, the original ver version of Clash of Eagles was a novella, which is a, a short 30,000 word, uh, like a very short book novel, essentially. And that was published in 2010 in an original anthology by Panverse Publishing. And I started pitching the Clash of Eagles novel to agents in 2012. I signed with a New York agent uh, later that year, and then Random House brought it bought it like a year later. They, they bought it as a trilogy. I pitched it as a trilogy. It was always going to be a trilogy all the way through. It has this big story that goes all the way through, as well as the individual story in the individual books. But I knew it was all one thing to start with. It's not like I wrote them piecemeal. So I, I got the Random House deal. Uh, Mike Braff, my editor, also uh, edits the Red Mars books by Pierce Brown, which some of you may know about. They're really good. If you, if you haven't checked those out, you probably should. Uh, and then in 2014, we were copy editing. I delivered the second book in 2014 and a uh, revised version in 2015. And it wasn't until 2015 that Clash of Eagles, the book, the hardback book, went on sale. So that's like three or three years. So there's a certain amount of endurance needed for this. <coughs> but you know, that's, that's how, the, how the system works if you're publishing through a major publishing house. And so the same thing was happening all of the, all, through all of this time. Uh, the books were coming out when the I'd actually delivered the third book when the second book came out. So I had to remember when I was doing interviews and podcasts and, uh, and things for the, that I was actually talking about the second book, not the one that I just finished writing. Next. And finally, the third string is the chromatics. Shifting gear, 90 degrees once again. Uh, the, the a cappella group, there's a list of CDs down the, down the side here uh, that we've been doing over the years, ever since 1988. We do a lot of performances in educational settings, in fact. We do, uh, every year we perform at the National Air and Space Museum, that's the astronomical repertoire. Uh, we've been to a number of other places, the Museum of Natural, Natural History in New York, Maryland Science Center, done road trips to Louisiana and so on. We also do a lot of science fiction conventions. We're gonna be at Balticon. We were recently at um, Farpoint, and we've, we've done PhilCon and Shore Leave quite a bit in the past. And we do festivals, we've done the Kennedy Center. And uh, we get to hang out with cool people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill, Bill, Bill Nye sometimes when we share a stage with them. And so that's been, a, that's been a cool thing that, as I say, has made me no money, but has been a, a solid passion over the years. Hasn't involved a whole lot of reading, but it has made me get up from behind the computer and kind of jump around <coughs> and dance and stuff. Next. 
This is the Astro Capella project. Um, I don't know actually how much time I have left, so somebody should flag me if I'm beginning to go over. Uh, the Astro Capella project, you can see there's a list of songs down here about the planets, the sun, the habitable zone, which is the, the zone that we're, the Earth is in. Uh, if you're further away, out beyond Mars, you're, you're too cold, and if you're further in, you're too hot. So we're at the, the Earth is at the nice place where, where we can have liquid water and where we can have life. And the songs about the moon and Mars, Little Bit of Rock is a song that I wrote about the comets, the meteors, and the asteroids. And we have various things about high energy astrophysics <coughs> and, the, and the radio astronomy as well. Next. Our CD has flown in space, no kidding. So this is where, this is where, the, where the parallels, where things start to, to mesh here. Because since we're writing astronomy songs and I, I work <coughs> at NASA, uh, what eventually happened was this is the first version of the Astro Capella CD, which has only six songs on. And a copy of that CD was actually taken up in the space shuttle on the, uh, on the servicing mission in, in, in 1999. And so you can see it floating there in space. And so, in a way, I, something I did did get up into space. So that was cool. Next. Here are six of the CDs <coughs> that we've done uh, over, the, over the many years, starting with First Light. And we have a couple of Christmas CDs, Unwrapped and Wasalicious and uh, all of that, so and next. And our most recent CD, which came out this year, is Fragments. Next slide, please. And that's, that's so, you can see I actually look pretty different. You probably can't see me very well, but I had dark hair in the, on the first album cover. Not so much these days. So, been doing this a while. We're not an a cappella group that just stands in one place and sings. We tend to be <coughs> active and jump around and, uh, and have, things that masquerade as choreography, movement anyway. So here are various pictures of the group next. And uh, so you, you can see that in addition to singing, I have to move around a fair amount on stage too. <laughs> next. So a couple of questions I get. How does being a scientist influence my writing? And it's funny because I kind of think that they're both the same thing in a funny sort of way. The Clash series, they're not hard science fiction in the usual sense. Another question I get is, since you're an astronomer, why don't you write hard science fiction? Why don't you write about spaceships and people going through the galaxy and space wars and stuff? And that is because it's too similar to the day job. It uses exactly the same part of my brain. And it's actually very hard to think about, uh, to, to keep thinking on, on that scientific level at evenings and weekends as I do during the day. So that's why I don't write hard science fiction. His Clash series are more historical fantasy, but they're still well grounded in historical fact. I've done a lot of research, a lot of reading. I've done popular reading. I've also read some, some of the more academic journal stuff to find the more obscure background details that really make, bring, that make the, the setting vivid. And so, as far as I could, apart, there, there are a couple of speculative elements in there, things that I made up. But if you read the books, you'll find that a lot of it is based on archaeological ground truth as much as I could. I tried to make it as accurate as possible. I tried to do justice to the Native American side and, and make sure that I got that as accurate as possible and that I was respectful of that. And so a lot of reading came in there. And I, was, I found that I was thinking very much as a scientist when I was doing that kind of reading, when I was doing that kind of mental exploration. And doing science research and researching in a book or a story are essentially somewhat similar processes, I think. The organization of the work is the same. Getting the point across is the same. And so something that I really believe is that science, if you're doing science, it actually does involve creativity. I mean, you can't just invent things, but it does involve a lot of mental flexibility. It does involve being able to think outside of the box sometimes, to understand concepts that aren't immediately obvious to you, perhaps, or that don't perhaps don't, don't seem to make sense, but are in fact true. So I think science does involve creative thinking. And at least art, the way I do it involves quite a lot of organization and logical thought. Next. How do all these things work together in your brain? My <laughs> mythological person is asking me here. And so this is the art versus craft thing. And what I find is I'm actually thinking about these things all the time. Even when I'm at work, I'm often kind of, my mind is flitting back to the stories that I'm writing. And so I'm thinking about those too. And when I'm at home writing, I find I'm thinking about work. So everything kind of synergizes off everything else. So it's, it's not like I'm doing one thing at a time. They're all informing each other. Everything I do is kind of interacting back and forth all the time. And I'm not sure whether it's the same for other people that do a lot of different things, but that's certainly how it works for me. And I think everything, I think everything I do works better because I'm doing the other things. And so one of the points that I want to make sure that I get across here is that you can do a lot of different things in your life. 
Uh, the last speaker was talking about several career paths and, uh, you know, and being a clown, being a face painter and doing the, doing the, the, the electrical stuff as well. Uh, he's done several things in his life, uh, sometimes consecutively. I'm trying to do as many things as possible simultaneously, which means that sometimes I don't get a lot of sleep. Uh, but the, the, when, you're, when you're starting and when you're young, you're often thinking in terms of the first job and thinking that that's the job you'll do all your life. And you're hearing again something you've already heard, which is that's not necessarily true. You can start a second career later on. You can start a, a, a hobby or something that's also really involving and sometimes you can make money at that too. But even so, it's, it's all part of leading a rich life, is having many different things that you can do, and many different things you can <coughs> enjoy, many different passions. Next. And so I think that's all I had to say, and I'm very happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, there, are my, uh, there are various websites there where you can find out more about me or more about the group. So thank you. Any questions? I have, not yet I have not yet written a song about Clash of Eagles. My agent was saying, you know, you can make a song about it and make it go viral on YouTube. And I'm like, I don't think going viral on YouTube is quite as easy as all that, Caitlin. But, uh, so, but no, I, I haven't actually written a song about that. But at the moment, I'm, tr I'm thinking about what the next books are that I'm going to write. And I have two different projects on the go. And for one of those, I kind of feel like I do have a song that would go with it. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of, that would be... Was the horse introduced? Yes, the Romans do bring the, the, bring the horse across. And so we, we, by the third book, we are seeing Native Americans riding horses uh, in North America because the horse had died out, of course, in the meantime. And so it was extinct at that time. So when the Native Americans first see horses, they're a little, you know, they're not quite sure what to do, just as they were in the history we know when Native Americans first, first met the horse. Uh, they were a little disconcerted by it, as anybody would be, because it's a big, scary thing. Uh, but by, but the, I do have Native Americans who are riding horses by the third book. Yep. Uh, what did it feel like to finish the trilogy? It was actually great um, for several reasons. Firstly, because all of this time I'd been writing this and it felt like this mountain that was in front of me. When I sold the books, I knew I had this huge amount of work that I had to do that was ahead of me. And as I was going through the third book and figuring out how everything worked, because I didn't have everything like intricately planned out in my mind, I had an outline. I knew the end point, and I knew what was going to happen roughly. But I didn't have all of the details set. So there's a certain amount of exploration as I went through it. And I could kind of feel the mountain decreasing in front of me as I got through the third book. And also because in the third book, there are scenes that I'd been waiting to write the whole series. There'd been cool stuff that I knew was coming, and I didn't want to write it until I got there. And so I'd been really looking forward to writing those scenes towards the end of the third book. And I, it was really satisfying when I got there and was able to write them. So, so it, it felt great for many reasons. It actually made it more interesting. The question was, did I come across anything in my research uh, that made me change anything dynamically in the books? And I don't think any of the large plot things changed. Certainly a lot of the smaller things, a lot of the, a lot of the interactions, a lot of the movement across the terrain, all of that, that was changed a lot by things that I discovered while I was writing. And actually, I found it interesting because I was like, oh, there's another cool detail I can put in. Here's something that would, that would really pop with the reader. Here's a really nice image. So yes, I would change things uh, according to things that I read. A lot of the Chaco Canyon stuff came along fairly late on when I realized how cool that was, and I went to that area. And so a lot of that also developed. There are, much, there are, there are more scenes there now as a result. And so, yeah, things, I, I did change things, but by and large, I don't think there was any time when I was incredibly frustrated or, you know, sad or I lost a plot point because something just wouldn't work. It is difficult, find, difficult moving around in North America when you don't have highways. And so I did spend a fair amount of time looking at Lewis and Clark, looking at the, uh, uh, the way people used to travel around North America before we had high technologies, and, and making sure that all of that worked. Sometimes you know, making, making sure that my characters had enough time to get from one place to another, and it wasn't as if they suddenly appeared there by magic, and trying to make that realistic. Uh, that was sometimes a challenge, kind of syncing up the storylines. But no, I, all, 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 th all things considered, I actually really enjoyed that.